welcome back to Who Done It Hall. Allow me to reintroduce myself. I'm Edgeworth, the butler, your guide to the master's extensive collection of mystery films. And when one is talking about the relative quality or merits of a mystery story, a criterion that often comes up is whether or not the mystery in question plays fair. If you do not partake of mystery stories on a regular basis, allow me to elaborate on this term. Playing fair is a term used by mystery writers and fans to describe a key element in a mystery's plotline. A mystery is said to play fair when all the information needed to solve the mystery is presented somewhere in the story in full view of the audience, thus giving them everything they need to solve the mystery for themselves. Whether the audience notices this information or not is not relevant. Generally, it takes a second reading or viewing to determine if a mystery is playing fair. Surprisingly, very few mysteries actually do play fair, often relying on surprise characters, twist endings, or unexpected revelations out of nowhere. Now, this is not to say that a mystery is bad if it doesn't play fair. What playing fair does is add another level of satisfaction to the audience when the solution is revealed, when they realize that they too had everything they needed to solve the mystery for themselves if they just paid attention to the story. Tonight's film is one of those rare film mysteries that does, in fact, play fair, while still providing enough twists and turns to make it enjoyable and unpredictable for any mystery lover. Tonight, we look at The Last of Sheila. Released in 1973 by Warner Brothers, The Last of Sheila has an unusual pedigree. The film was written by the unexpected writing team of renowned composer Stephen Sondheim and actor Anthony Perkins, best known for playing Norman Bates in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. The two were friends and were also avid games enthusiasts, creating elaborate party games for their friends. These interests, along with their general displeasure at life in Hollywood, collide in The Last of Sheila. The film also features an all-star cast consisting of James Coburn, Richard Benjamin, Diane Cannon, Joan Hackett, James Mason, Ian McShane, and Raquel Welsh. Response to the film was largely positive, earning Sondheim and Perkins an Edgar Award in 1974 for Best Screenplay. However, after its theatrical release, it faded somewhat into obscurity, achieving cult status fairly recently when Warner Brothers released it as a manufacture-on-demand product as part of its Warner Archive collection. So, let us see if playing fair is enough to keep us engaged. But first, a word of warning. Much like the Sleuth Review, this film has many twists and turns in the plot and revelations throughout which means that some of them will be revealed over the course of this review, although the ultimate solution will, of course, remain unseen as per usual. If you would prefer to see this film completely spoiler-free, I encourage you to stop this video now, see the film, and then come back. And now that that's taken care of, let us look at The Last of Sheila, a mystery so intricate that even the title is a clue. The film opens as we see Hollywood gossip columnist Sheila Green having an argument with her husband, movie producer Clinton Green, played by James Coburn. A party is in progress, and Sheila storms off for reasons that are unknown to us. Unfortunately, this will prove to be the last mistake Sheila will ever make. The driver of the car opens the door, realizes what they've done, but rather than going for help, they get back in the car and speed off. We then dissolve to a year later on Clinton's private yacht off the coast of France, where he is creating the props needed for a new game intended for six specific players. All these players were, as will be revealed, at Clinton's house the night that Sheila was killed, which means that there is most likely more to Clinton's game than meets the eye. The players include screenwriter Tom Parkman and his wife, Hollywood heiress Lee, played by Richard Benjamin and Joan Hackett, high-powered agent Christine, played by Diane Cannon, director Philip Dexter, played by James Mason, and actress Alice Wood and her husband and manager Anthony, played by Raquel Welsh and Ian McShane. Seven high-powered Hollywood insiders on a yacht off the coast of France for a week of fun and games. And if you believe that, and you also believe that they all don't have some sort of ulterior motive in attending, and if you believe that Clinton only had his friends out here for no good reason, you have absolutely no idea how Hollywood actually works. Things get underway immediately when Tom and Lee are met by Clinton and the rest of the group on the dock, and Clinton insists on getting a group photo of all of them. All right, now let's smile or whatever you people do for a living. Take that hat off, Christine. All right, now squeeze in close. Come on, come on, squeeze in closer, you'll be out of the picture. And I don't mean this one. Perfect. <laughs> I'll study up six hungry failures. Just kidding, gang. 
If these people had been frequent guests at the hall, they would have been immediately suspicious of any sort of group photo being taken, as the last time we did that, all of the guests suffered unfortunate accidents over the next three days. Although, admittedly, the incident involving the car battery and the starving tiger might not have been as accidental as it seemed. Clinton pins up the picture in the lounge of the yacht, and later that afternoon reveals that he has plans to make a new film based on the life of Sheila, which, of course, he uses to dangle the promise of a job opportunity over the group, giving them more incentive to play his game, for which he obligingly explains the rules. Now, I dreamed up six secrets, one for each of you, six little pretend pieces of gossip. Now, keep them secret. Well, this one's only taken me a month to prepare, he said modestly. <laughs> Smile, listen. That's what I've always wanted to be. No, 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 no. Don't throw it away. Keep them till Saturday and don't show them. Well, the idea is to discover everybody's secret without speaking, of course, and prevent the other players from discovering yours. And how do we do that? Well, every day we'll park in a different port where you can discover the proof of one person's secret. I'll announce what secret it is to look for and give you a clue, which will tell you what to do and where to go on shore. Now, if you solve the clue properly, it'll lead you to where the proof is. That night, the first round of the game begins with the players trying to find out who has the shoplifter card. Their clue? A silver key engraved with the legend Sterling 18K. Lee and Christine check local silver shops, with Lee managing to gain an advantage over Christine, while Anthony has little luck getting anywhere. Both Philip and Tom have better success, arriving at the Hotel Sterling, where Philip compares his key with the room keys of the hotel. Tom, on the other hand, has more success. Chanel number five. <laughs> Very good, Clinton. Very good. Here are all the known photographs of the brutal shoplifter who has terrified the sniveling merchants of the Riviera for the past 20 years. Here is the only headshot taken by Bruno of Hollywood. <laughs> is this it? What is that? No, don't get your hopes up, Donnie. It's not our host who's standing behind the door. You go play pinball machines. Clever, yes? Shortly after Lee departs, Philip arrives in the room, and since he possesses the shoplifter card, that means that the game is effectively over for the night. However, if you've noticed, there was one particular person who didn't seem all that interested in playing this round. As we see, Alice spends most of the evening sitting in a cafe and making no effort to solve the clue. And as it turns out, she appears to have another connection to one of the other players, as we see later back on the boat. Which is also where we get our first indication that the made-up gossip may not be entirely made up. I was broke. Jean wasn't keeping me anymore, and... I don't know, suddenly I just got this urge to take something. Anything. Oh, I told myself it was because I was broke, but... Really, it was just this urge. So I ripped off a leopard coat, big brown buttons, and slash pockets. Poor thing. But of course I got caught. The master's 17th ex-wife had a similar problem. Terminal kleptomania. Tragic. Even more so when she accidentally shoplifted that faulty landmine from the local Army-Navy surplus. After this meeting, Alice and Anthony argue, Christine uh, <clears throat> makes time with Clinton in the bath, and Lee and Philip have a conversation on deck. Lord, I hope that Clinton really does intend to do this movie. Tom has done nothing but rewrite jobs for so long now. And need I tell you the two years we've tried living off Clinton's options on Freak Show? Hardly paid for the pool maintenance. If a um, class of second-rate brandy at this hour might excuse a certain tactlessness, why don't you simply dip into capital and produce your own picture? Private finance is not that uncommon nowadays. Can you imagine how Tom would feel about that? Well, hi-ho, gang. Going over your hand signals for the bridge tournament? <laughs> how do I feel about what? The next day, the players relax and wait for the next round of the game to start. Anthony asks Clinton for an associate producer position on the film, which Clinton rejects. Alice tries to apologize for Anthony's tactlessness, but Clinton also blows her off, figuring her approach is another attempt to get Anthony the job. As Clinton snorkels, Christine relaxes on a raft off the boat. 
but someone, after making sure that the crew is otherwise occupied, has murderous intentions. almost exactly how the monster's 23rd ex-wife went. Although, admittedly, the propellers in question were actually ceiling fans that the monster had installed in the spa. In retrospect, I probably should have protested more about him installing them everywhere except the ceiling. Christine is rescued, although admittedly hysterical, and Clinton berates the crew for the accident. Philip and Tom discuss it later. Alice claims to have been in her cabin. I was in the lounge with Guido. Lee was on the top deck. I was in my cabin. According to the rules of the genre, we should now be looking for a motive. Even Clinton could have climbed up the other ladder and started the engine. Well, 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 not pawing through my bag of tricks there, are you, Dad? No, Clinton. Oh. Trying to get my attention? Oh. Right back. The month of the year. Don't you slip a disc. No, don't answer that. We don't want this topic to degenerate into the discussion phase. Take a pill. Victorio, get my friend two blue for the purple stripe. Maybe if I stayed out of tonight's game. Oh, Jesus, I'd really hate that. Okay, sir. Just as long as you're ready for Saturday night, which is your biggie. Saturday? Yep. Clinton leaves the boat to set up the next round of the game on a small island where there is a medieval monastery. A couple of hours later, Clinton delivers some custom-made brochures about the monastery to the players and lets them know that this time they're looking for the player with the homosexual card. After reading the brochures and puzzling over them, Tom asks Lee a pertinent question. Honey, honey, I know this isn't the kind of junk you keep in your head, but, um... Look well, can you ever remember hearing any gossip about Alice being arrested? For taking something from a shop. Downstairs, Tom takes a quick shower and Lee decides to wait for him on deck. But shortly after she leaves, someone enters the room and sneaks a peek at Tom's card. I do hope that you've been paying attention so far. The players head for the monastery, where Sign informs them that for this round of the game, they need to keep silent and wear hooded monk's robes. No sooner are they attired than they begin hearing chanting coming from several different passages in the room. They begin exploring, and Philip is the first to find where Clinton is hiding this time. <laughs> That's disgusting. By Cabo. Shh. You're supposed to be Alice, obviously. And you're supposed to be on the other side so I can use the slider. Much more effective, but the door's stuck. Ah, damn it. I was a lobster when I moved it. Can I help? No, just piss off. My son. As Philip leaves, Tom spots where he emerged from and enters the same room, surprising Clinton, who dashes back into the confessional. Clinton asks Tom if the volume is too loud. Tom responds that it may be too low, and Clinton decides to open the chapel door wider. Shortly after this, Christine arrives. As Christine leaves, she encounters someone else on the way out, but we're unsure of just who it is. A storm starts up, and Alice happens to hear an odd breaking sound coming from the room with the confessional. We then see Clinton's dead body fall out of the confessional onto the ground. Alice goes to investigate the sound she heard, but the murderer is caught off guard and quickly shoves the game over sign under the door to drive Alice off. The next morning, everyone discovers that Clinton never returned to the boat and go back to the monastery, where they make a grisly discovery.
Something's wrong. I hope you brought your fingerprint kit. I see Clinton finally got this door open, breaking it in the process, as usual. didn't smoke cigarettes. With these confounding clues, the group returns to the boat, where they are informed that due to inclement weather and other problems, the authorities will not be able to arrive for at least eight hours. This means it's time to put all our characters into a room and have them start theorizing about what they know about the game and the circumstances of Clinton's murder. Alice reveals that she had the homosexual card and that it was odd that the door was unlocked that morning because it was locked the night before and the Game Over card was put out despite the fact that the game should have gone on until she found Clinton. This brings Tom to point out a few things. Not unless he was crawling. Why would he be crawling? Uh, the, the stone that fell on Clinton's head came from the base of the column. It was grooved. The tops of the columns are shaped like acanthus leaves. The bottoms are grooved. Uh, Interesting point number one. Then uh, there was that piece of wood. What's that? I found it in the folds of Clinton's rope. It's from the grill on the door to the priest box. Interesting point number two. Um, um, I didn't see any grill on the priest's door. Oh, right. You never found him, you said. Now, what do you mean he said? There was a grill last night, but not this morning. That grill was removed. Why? Where's the rest of it? And what was this doing in the priest's box? Clinton didn't smoke cigarettes. Newport. I'm not the only one who smokes Newports. Come on. There are cartons all over the ship. I'm smoking one. Hey, what's the difference? Did you smoke in there? No. You? I never found it. Of course, I forgot. Honey? I don't know. I don't remember. But surely not in the priest box. No, of course not. Interesting point number three. A cigarette nobody smoked. See, <clears throat> I don't think Clinton died near the pillar at all. I think he died in the priest box. Naturally, everyone believes that Tom is accusing one of them of killing Clinton. Tom states that there is one person who could tell them what happened. Well... <clears throat> There is someone who might clear this up for us. Who? Clinton. So help me God, if this is a hoax, and he comes waltzing through that door, I'm going to throw this cut glass ashtray right in his face. Ooh, that's a nasty rebuttal to a practical joke if I ever heard one. Particularly since good cut glass is so hard to find. I've found in those sorts of situations that a sealed bottle of Jim Beam is perfectly serviceable. Tom has everyone retrieve their cards for the game and theorizes that the gossip printed on them is, in fact, true, but the gossip assigned to each person is actually for someone else in the group. All right, all right. Now, we all knew about two of these secrets. We've already played them. Shoplifter and homosexual. The others were seeing for the first time. Ex-convict, informer, child mo Oh, excuse me. Little child molester and mine. So, this was Clinton's idea for a week of fun. Him assigning us secrets, us discovering them, and it was a good game. But some of us began to suspect there was more to it than met the eye. That Clinton had not assigned these six secrets at random, but that each player had been at one time in his life guilty of one of them. Tom reveals his hit-and-run killer card, and everyone realizes the point of the game was to out the person Clinton thought, but could not prove, had killed Sheila the year before. But noticing no one is left yet, Tom starts letting out the truth by revealing that he once had a homosexual relationship with Clinton some time ago. Other secrets come out. Alice, of course, was arrested for shoplifting. Christine named some of her Hollywood friends and contacts to the House Un-American Activities Committee. And Anthony confesses to having spent time in prison. Which, of course, brings us to the last two secrets. 
the most sordid ones, with only Philip and Lee left to fulfill them. By which I just mean, let me get this over with. I was drunk. I was too drunk to drive. No, Tom, stay there, please. I am so sorry I didn't tell you. I knew you would have helped me do the right thing, but I just couldn't. I drove down the coast to the party. I overshot the driveway. My car skidded. I didn't even see her. I panicked, so I turned around and I drove all the way back to Santa Barbara. The next morning I wrote that silly note about having to visit my school friend, and I took the car and I drove as far away as I could. Las Vegas. I traded cars at the car rental place, and then that afternoon I drove home. And I thought I was safe. Lee then proceeds to confess to attacking Clinton with the candle holder through the door of the priest box, smashing out the grill in the process and making the death look like an accident. After her confession, she goes down to her cabin. Tom heads down to make sure she isn't planning on killing herself, but Lee has locked herself in a room saying she wants to sleep, but that she'll be okay. Of course, Lee is anything but okay. And lest you think I've gone and spoiled the solution of the mystery for you, keep watching. There's more to come. Later, Tom heads down to check on Lee. Later that evening, Philip is pondering the cigarette butt. He starts to ask Tom a question, but Tom is asleep. Philip then heads to the wheelhouse, acquiring the master key to the cabins, and heads below deck to check on Lee for himself, where he makes some unpleasant discoveries. So, with Lee having evidently committed suicide, it would seem the police have a fait accompli on their hands. Or do they? As the bodies are retrieved, we discover that Tom has been Alice's secret contact on the trip and that they've apparently been having an affair for some time. However, with Lee dead, Alice feels it isn't right to cheat on her husband with the newly single Tom and ends the affair right then. Everyone then disembarks, planning on staying at a nearby hotel, with the exception of Philip, who states he didn't bring any extra cash and will be staying on the yacht for the remainder of the week. As the crew enjoys their unexpected leave, Tom heads out for a walk along the dock, but finds the lights keep going on and off inside the yacht. Inside, he finds Philip turning the lights on, lighting a cigarette, dropping it on a tray, then turning the lights off again. Now, try this one. Quickly, just once. Uh -huh. mm. Now let it burn out. You see, if it's dark and it's awkward for you, you may stamp on the filter instead of the lit end. If you only have one shot at it. As Clinton did. Clinton? It was in the box where he was killed, after all. Bear what? with me, please. Now, remember, we both thought this came from the priest's box. It doesn't. That wood was carved. This is plain. It's from a side grill. How did it find its way into Clinton's robe? Someone broke the grill. Ah. You're saying who? Could we be shy, one actor, and then the piece? Meaning someone who saw the whole thing. Now, none of it would seem quite so sinister if it went for this. We found Lee in Clinton's stateroom. But her cabin was locked from the outside. What could she have locked it with? 
The only key to the cabins was in the wheelhouse. Hmm. Well, she probably went into the john and out through my cabin. No, because your door to the bathroom was bolted from the inside. I had to unbolt it myself. So it appears there is more to Lee's suicide than we thought. And that may also mean that there's more of Clinton's murder to take into account as well. Tom. Hmm? He kept the East Party. Where's the ice pick? And then that awful, far away look in his eye. What? I said, where's the bloody ice pick? The important moment happened before Lee came into the chapel. Whoever it was lit a cigarette and, and dropped it through the grill. Hey! And then, as, as Clinton leaned forward to stamp it out, stabbed him in the back of the neck with the ice pick. Then, I assume he started to leave the field, but... Uh, Just give us the news, please. He Clinton, might have hoped to make a run for it, but the, the, the sprung door meant that Christine would have a clear view of anyone trying to sneak out of the chapel. I happened to notice that when we discovered the body. Small wonder that Clinton had a, an awful faraway look in his eye. Ah! Now, the moment Christine left, he intended to duck out as soon as he possibly could, but the timing was still unlucky because somebody else came in. Brilliant. Lee. Now, she wasn't going to go until she'd had her showdown with uh, Clinton. So he, he drove her into a state of hysteria. Clinton? Convinced that she'd panic and run. Now, there's taking an awful chance because she could have raised her voice enough to draw attention. But... Luck was on the murderer's side because Lee presented him with the best possible solution. She exploded. She killed a dead man. And with this revelation, I'm afraid I must stop this review right here. However, if you've been paying attention, I think you'll find you may have a very good idea of who the murderer actually is. Because I, too, have been playing fair throughout this entire review. Of course, you're still going to need to track down this film for yourself if you want to confirm your theory. The Last of Sheila is a truly brilliant mystery. The twists and turns in the plot are engaging and logical. Once you know the ultimate solution, you realize that it is the only possible way things could have played out, and repeated viewings will have you noticing little hints and details you never noticed before. The cast is excellent, with Diane Cannon, Joan Hackett, and James Mason as standouts with their performances. And of course, as despicable as Clinton Green is, James Coburn makes him an entertaining scoundrel to watch. This is a forgotten gem of a mystery that truly deserves to be brought back into the light. As mentioned, The Last of Sheila was made available on DVD through Warner Brothers' Warner Archive collection as a manufacturer-on-demand product. However, as of production of this video, it seems that Warner Archive has removed it from its listings, which means your only way to get a hold of a copy would be to either procure it from Amazon or some other retailer, although YouTube does provide it available for rent for a small fee. If you like well-crafted mysteries with wonderful acting, interesting characters, and a sense of playfulness, I cannot recommend this film enough. Ever since I discovered it in the Masters Collection, it has actually become one of my personal favorites, and you owe it to yourself as a true mystery lover to see this movie and appreciate it. And with that, I'm afraid I must draw this visit to a close. It's the Masters Biannual Games Night, and we still have preparations to make. Specifically, I think we still need to find some more landmines out on the croquet lawn. There must be at least a half a dozen of them out there. Oh dear. Make that five. Uh, in any event, uh, please join me again for another visit to the Master's extensive collection here at Whodunit Hall. Eustace Cunnington! One of the landmines went off! Get the fire extinguishers, the grass seed, and the dental records! Mm -hmm.